morning. morning. Um, We're going to read from John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we're going to read from verse 24. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Let's just um, bring our time before God with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a gracious and kind God. We would ask that you would bless speaker and hearer alike, that what we would hear would be not from any man, but would be from you. We ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I would imagine that many of you on some level will be familiar with this passage from John chapter 20 where Jesus appears to Thomas. It's a relatively well-known story, although I suspect that the first thing that comes to mind for many of us when recalling it is simply the unfortunate title that's come to be associated with Thomas, that of, of course, Doubting Thomas. That title is one that's even entered our wider culture and reflected in the experiences of people, perhaps of an older generation, who can remember being told or encouraged not to be a Doubting Thomas. It's often seen as the headline, if you like, or the central theme of this passage, And it would probably be quite easy to preach a sermon that would focus in upon that theme. Something like, look at Doubting Thomas. He's an example of what we should not be. So don't doubt Christian belief. Something along those lines. However, to do so would be to do a great disservice to the passage before us, which is far more to offer than simply the theme of Doubting Thomas. I also suspect that to take such an approach would be very discouraging to the average Christian who knows all too well what it is to doubt, what it is to have a faith that's shaky at best. If that's your experience, and it's certainly been mine, then to be told simply not to doubt may not be particularly helpful. Instead, it might just encourage us to pretend that we never have any doubts, to suppress them, rather than to acknowledge that we're sometimes prone to doubt and that there may be a benefit in addressing our doubts head on. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you to consider one very simple question as we grapple with the passage before us. One simple question. And it's just, how should we deal with our doubts? How should we deal with our doubts? Doubt, of course, comes in all shapes and sizes, and it may be that there are specific issues that we need to address in order to get to the heart of our problems in this area. So before we launch into the passage, we're going to pause for a little while um, just to consider the kind of doubts that Christians might struggle with and how we might tackle them with God's help. In our book, Permission to Doubt, the Christian writer and speaker Anne Sullivan outlines three general types of doubt that typically might afflict the Christian at some stage in their walk with Jesus. Three 
different types of doubt, intellectual, spiritual and emotional doubt. Often these will be interwoven rather than neatly separated, but we're going to consider them in turn, starting with intellectual doubt. What is meant by that? Intellectual doubt. Well, Anne Sullivan succinctly writes of this kind of doubt as involving good questions demanding practical answers. Good questions demanding practical answers. This is the realm of our minds necessitating the exercise of our brains, our willingness to seek out knowledge in order to answer the questions that we might have. Examples of questions might be around the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, why there is suffering in this world, how it is that bad things often seem to happen to good people, whereas often the bad eggs seem to have a great time. The danger is that rather than tackling the questions we do have, we leave them unanswered and allow them to fester, perhaps out of laziness or because we feel that we're too busy or even some sort of misplaced reverence. Mrs. Sullivan puts it this way. Many of us avoid asking the big questions for a number of reasons. Some of us were taught that our inquiries are a sign of disrespect or unbelief. Others of us are afraid that our faith will buckle under pressure. Some sidestep investigations altogether, fearing that God will somehow be offended. But if God is really God, how could he ever be threatened by us? If our faith is rooted in truth and our ability to reason as a gift from him, shouldn't he be able to handle any question that we come up with? The answer, of course, is that God can handle and can answer any genuine question that we have, but that we need to be willing to seek out the answers in the manner of his choosing, in his word, in our Bibles. The idea that somehow being a Christian means switching off your brain is absolute nonsense. We're called to engage our minds, to think these things through, using our brains as a necessity, not an option. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. Um, and this is Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What does that actually mean? Well, as the Christian writer Jerry Bridges points out, our own convictions, our own values will either come primarily from the society around us or as our minds are renewed by the word of God, by the Bible. Paul is actually asking his readers to put themselves under the transforming influence of the Bible with a view to developing and sustaining Bible-based convictions about the important stuff, who we are, who God is, how we should live, etc. To prize God's opinion over even that of our family, that of our friends, that of our peers, our politicians, our heroes, whoever they may be. This needs to be the daily task of every Christian. You and I need to be exploring our Bibles with our thinking caps on, going there first for the answers to the, the questions that we might have. And we'll all have questions. In this way, our doubts can lead us into a deeper, more thoughtful relationship with God and equip us to be better witnesses to those around us who may have challenging questions of their own to ask. Consider these words from the theologian and pastor Timothy Keller from his book, The Reason for God, on the need for Christians to tackle such questions head on. You can see it up here if you want to read along. A faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight 
if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubts, not only their own, but their friends and neighbours. It's no longer sufficient to hold beliefs just because you inherited them. Only if you struggle long and hard with objections to your faith will you be able to provide grounds for your beliefs to sceptics, including yourself, that are plausible rather than ridiculous or offensive. Got questions you want answered? Get to know your Bible. Seek out the answers there. You can do that with the help of other Christians in the context of a Bible study or with the assistance of a good commentary or a Christian book. Ultimately, each one of us will need the help of God, so prayer will be an absolute necessity. But intellectual doubt, nevertheless, requires us to be thinking Christians, thinking Christians. What about spiritual doubt then? Anne Sullivan defines spiritual doubt as the discomfort that surfaces because of the inability for good and evil to comfortably coexist. It's a bit of a mouthful, that. The discomfort that surfaces because of the inability for good and evil to comfortably coexist. That sounds very complicated, but to put it simply, it means for the true Christian it will never be entirely comfortable for us to sin. But nevertheless, we will know what it is to experience the attack of evil in our lives. We will know that. We can break this down into two simple key areas for the Christian. The spiritual doubt which we cause ourselves and that which is caused by forces around us. Let's start then with the doubts that we cause ourselves, taking a straightforward example from the Old Testament with the well-known story of King David and Bathsheba, which you can read about in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel. So essentially, if you read that, the sorry tale that unfolds there is this. King David, a true follower of God, lusts after a beautiful woman who's already married. He sleeps with her and then he organises for her husband, husband to be killed in the front line of battle. Pretty nasty stuff. And how does that impact King David's relationship with God? Well, we get a sense of that from Psalm 32, where David writes specifically about how his own unconfessed sin affected his relationship with God. You can see it up in the slide here, Psalm 32, verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David did not enjoy the closeness with God that he'd enjoyed before because of his own sin. This put a distance between him and God. And of course, in a very similar way, we too can have that experience. We may have doubts about our standing before God because of ongoing sin in our lives, things we're doing or thinking that we know are wrong and are contrary to God's plan for us as believers. Inevitably, such things will come between us and God, between us and God rather. And that distance, that distance can cause all kinds of doubts to creep in for the believer. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe Jesus didn't die for me. Maybe I shouldn't go to church because I'm not worthy. And so it goes on and on and on. If you're in that place today, then you need to do what David did eventually and confess your sins to God. You need to seek his forgiveness and make every effort to turn away from that behavior, from that habit perhaps that's entrapped you. Psalm 32 verse 5, also up on our slide. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then we have a, another kind of spiritual doubt. This is a spiritual doubt that is caused by external forces outside of ourselves. It's easy for us to forget that there is more to this world than what meets the eye. That there is a spiritual war taking place all around us. That we sometimes 
are completely oblivious to it simply because we can't see it with our own eyes. But that doesn't change the reality of it. As Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians, Ephesians 6 verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It would be easy to misread verses like that and imagine some sort of ethereal conflict way out there somewhere. But the reality is that this is a conflict that we're caught up in here and now. This is real for us. This is what Paul is writing about, real life. A fight between good and evil, ultimately between God and the devil. Sometimes we might recognise the influence of such evil in horrible random thoughts that suddenly enter our minds out of nowhere. Often at the most unhelpful times, at the communion table, just before you're going to speak to people at the family service. Thoughts that we would never share with those around us because they're so awful and shameful. But the important thing for us to consider today is not the nature of these attacks, but how we deal with them, how we should deal with them. And Paul in his letter to the Ephesians goes on to provide us with a comprehensive an answer to that question how we should deal with them therefore put on the full armor of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground paul then goes on to identify the different parts of the armor that the christian needs to put on to defend him or herself against those attacks we don't have time to unpack that today but the crux of the matter is our absolute need our absolute need for an intimate relationship with God, with Jesus, our Lord. And to know that relationship involves us in participating in what we might call spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. As Anne Sullivan writes, by listening to God speak, spending time with him in prayer and confession and meditating on his truth, regardless of how we feel about it, it's through these simple spiritual disciplines that we draw near to God and he draws near to us. In order to place Jesus at the centre of our lives, we need to develop what we might call holy habits. Holy habits that will help us to do that. Remember the verse from James 4 and verse 8, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That involves active effort on our part, ensuring that our daily priorities reflect this need to have God at the centre. But so often we fall short in that area, don't we? Our time with God is often an afterthought, perhaps at the end of the day, rather than our starting point. But if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You can't have a meaningful relationship with someone if you're not willing to spend time with them. You know, think about those of you who are married, who are in relationships like that. If you don't spend time with your spouses, what impact is that going to have on your relationship? So we've considered intellectual doubt, which necessitates us in being thinking Christians. We've considered spiritual doubt, which on the negative side can be caused by the effect of ongoing sin in our lives. But more positively, we can address by developing intimacy with God through daily spiritual disciplines such as prayer, reading and meditating upon the Bible, and by placing ourselves under the teaching of the Bible in settings such as this. But the last kind of doubt we're going to consider is perhaps the most common of all, emotional doubt. Emotional doubt. So this is where our feelings get the better of us and cloud our grasp of the facts. The kind of doubt that can often strike when we're going through hard times. Perhaps mourning the loss of a loved one. Struggling with disillusionment in the context of challenges at work or at home. Feeling hopeless in the face of people that we've prayed for who just never ever seem like they're going to become Christians. They're never going to believe. And in all of that, we just don't feel God's presence in our lives. We wonder where he is and why he isn't doing things the way we, we would do them. 
Why isn't God just doing it as we would want it? Why isn't he here? Why can't we feel his presence in our lives? Intellectual, spiritual and emotional doubt. I wonder what kind of doubt you've experienced. I know these are doubts that are familiar to me. And what of doubting Thomas? What kind of doubt do you think he's experiencing? Let's go there now to our passage in John chapter 20. Although Thomas is merely listed in the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, he plays a more significant role in John's account and perhaps one that doesn't readily square with the doubting Thomas that we meet in chapter 20. In John chapter 11, we read of Thomas's response to Jesus' comments in respect of the recently deceased Lazarus, thinking that Jesus is going to his imminent death and that Thomas can somehow face this with him. In a somewhat confused state, Thomas displays considerable courage and devotion when he tells the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And then in John chapter 14, we encounter a similarly confused Thomas, who misunderstanding what Jesus has just said about returning to his heavenly father, poses the question, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? How can we know the way? Consequently, the sense that we already have of Thomas by the time we meet him here in our passage in John chapter 20 is of someone who is very loyal, someone who is brave, but who is also confused by much of what Jesus has said, much like his fellow disciples, particularly in respect of Jesus' identity, who Jesus is, his death, what that means, and his resurrection, of course. And with this in mind, we need to remember that for Thomas and the other disciples, Jesus' death at the actual time was deeply confusing and frightening. They did not yet have the God-given understanding and wisdom to make sense of what was happening. It's difficult for us in the here and now to relate to how they would have been thinking and feeling then, as we have the whole picture before us. We can not only read of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, but with God's help we can make sense of these important events through study of the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament. However, for Jesus' followers at the time, this was their beloved Messiah, the one whom they had walked and talked with, they'd broken bread with, they'd hoped would lead them to a glorious future. They weren't anticipating that Jesus would die a criminal's death and that they would be hiding out in fear for their own lives with only an uncertain future before them. It's in that context that we find the Thomas of chapter 20 of John, a man who by this time is in emotional turmoil, confused, frightened, heartbroken, disappointed. So perhaps we shouldn't be very surprised at the very human response that Thomas gives to his fellow disciples when they excitedly tell him we have seen the Lord. This somewhat jaded and defiant response, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. An understandable and very human response, but a wrong one nevertheless. Why? Well, consider the way in which Thomas frames his response to the other disciples. As the Scottish pastor Alistair Begg identifies, Thomas does not say that he cannot believe, because of course he could believe what the other disciples are telling him. Rather, he declares he will not believe. He will not believe. Thomas actively chooses not to believe unless certain conditions of his own making are met. That he gets to see the physical evidence of Jesus' crucifixion on his resurrected body. Despite being told by all the other disciples who've only recently encountered the resurrected Jesus, Thomas will not believe unless he sees the proof for himself until he is face to face with the risen Jesus. Thomas asserts that he requires his conditions to be met for him to believe. I wonder if that in some way describes you today. Perhaps you're different to Thomas in that you've never been a follower of Christ. 
There might be someone in here who never has been. You do, though, share Thomas's unwillingness to believe. You're different from Thomas because he certainly was a follower. But you do share this unwillingness to believe unless your conditions are met. You're, you're actually way beyond the realms of the doubts that we've been exploring because you don't yet have any real belief. You may come here on a regular basis, but you're still looking for Jesus to make a personal appearance just for you. In the flesh, if only we just sit you down in the here and now and talk you through everything himself, then you would be believe. You'd be willing to believe then. But the truth of the matter is this. You don't really want that to happen and it's not going to. Cast your eyes down to verse 30 of our passage and heed what is written there. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, everything that you need to become a follower of Jesus, to become a believer, is already written down here in the Gospels and in the Bible. Indeed, that's why it's written down here, so that you may believe. Laying down further conditions for belief is just a way to avoid what lies at the heart of the matter. That your objections to believing in Jesus are not ultimately intellectual in nature. They're moral in nature. They're moral in nature. And that's the case for every person before they come to faith. I can tell you that because it wasn't so long ago that I was there. I was sat where you are trying to convince myself that I would make that commitment if only I could know for sure. If only Jesus would sit down beside me and tell me that he was real. But the reality was that I didn't want to make the commitment. I wasn't ready to leave my self-centered lifestyle at the time. I was too worried about missing the nights out with my pals. I was too worried about what people would think of me if I became a Christian. If we're honest, it's not that we would believe if the evidence was there. No, we don't want the evidence that is there. Because we don't want the implications of a God who demands our obedience. Of a Jesus who calls us to follow him completely and to leave our old lives behind. If you're in here today and you're not a believer, don't kid yourself on in the way that I once did. If you choose not to believe in Jesus, you do so because ultimately you don't want to believe. Not because the evidence isn't there, because it's right there before you. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Back to Thomas then. As we've observed, he chooses not to believe his fellow disciples, but instead lays down his conditions for belief. Don't you think that Jesus would have good cause to feel irritated by Thomas, if not infuriated by him? Consider, prior to his death, Jesus had told Thomas and the other disciples what would happen, and that's exactly what takes place. Fair enough, the disciples hadn't understood what was going on, but Thomas has now been told by his fellow disciples that they've seen the risen Jesus and yet he still refuses to believe. What is it with Thomas? If this were you and me, we might be tempted to let Thomas rot in his unbelief. Or perhaps we want to confront him, get him into a headlock, give him a good doing over and then dismiss him from the group on account of his failings. But of course Jesus does something very different. A week later, you can see the verses up here in the slide, a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. In his boundless compassion and endless patience, Jesus appears again to the disciples, this time very deliberately, including Thomas. But more than that, he chooses to cater to Thomas's conditions for belief, inviting him to see the very wounds born for the likes of Thomas and for the likes of you and me. Jesus, who had not long ago just died an agonizing death on a cross, experienced hell itself itself, 
in separation from his father. He's still willing to accommodate himself to the disbelieving, wavering weakness of doubting Thomas. If you're a Christian today, this is your Jesus, forever ready to tend to the needs of his followers, to you and me. A shepherd willing to rescue us from our failings, from our lack of trust, from our erratic faith. And yes, willing to meet us where we are in terms of our doubts and questions. So what if Thomas caught up in his feelings of loss, heartbreak, disappointment, anger and frustration, unwilling to listen to his fellow disciples and believe that Jesus has risen from the dead? It's not intellectual or spiritual doubt that has struck Thomas, is it? It sounds much more like emotional doubt in Thomas's case. But Thomas gets the perfect response, doesn't he? Jesus appears to him personally and even invites him to examine his resurrection body. Why can't Jesus just visit us in the same way, in the flesh, when we're struggling with our doubts? Well, we've got to acknowledge Thomas's unique position as one of the 12 apostles. You see, to be one of the twelve was to have a very particular responsibility as a witness for Jesus to the wider world. This had to be someone who'd been with Jesus throughout his ministry on earth and had seen the resurrected Jesus. Consider the words of the Apostle Peter to his fellow disciples on the need to replace Judas Iscariot, who of course had betrayed Jesus and subsequently killed himself. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who had been with us, sorry, had been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In other words, for Thomas to be one of the apostles, he had to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. This was necessary for him to undertake that role, not optional. Why is this important for the apostles to have seen the resurrected Jesus? Because ultimately the apostles were to be witnesses to what Jesus did in his life, death and resurrection. They are witnesses. They're not there to talk about how Jesus was a nice guy or how he was wise and he had some good anecdotes or he was a remarkable miracle worker. They're called to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is the very Son of God who achieved his mission whilst on this earth, taking our sins to the cross at Calvary, conquering death itself, that we might take him as our saviour, our righteousness before a holy God. This is where we need to return with our doubts, our weaknesses and anxieties. We may not see Jesus in the flesh, in this life, but we can go in faith to the cross at Calvary and we can remind our hearts there of all that Jesus has done for us in faith. Consider Jesus' words to Thomas in verse 29 of our passage. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's words for you and me here today in this room. We are called to do what Thomas failed to do, to believe the witness of the apostles. That's the miracle of faith, of seeing a reality beyond what our physical eyes can see, a reality that God reveals to us in his word through the good news of the gospel. And then we too with Thomas will be able to say this, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. This is what we should remember Thomas for. Not for the obstinate doubting, but as Timothy Keller notes, for the most remarkable and gospel-centred response in all of the book of John and all of the gospels, really. Matthew, Mark and Luke. Thomas proclaims that Jesus is God, but more than that, he declares him to be my God, my God. Because it's in a relationship with Christ that ultimately we find sanctuary from all our doubts whether emotional, spiritual, or intellectual. One, a relationship that we have to foster by coming to God in prayer and through the reading of his word. But it's in the shadow of the cross that our doubts are truly blown away. 
because there we meet the undeniable love that God has shown for each one of us in the shed blood of his son, in the wounds that Jesus bore in his flesh so that we can say, my Lord, my God. If you can't say that today, hear the challenge, hear the call in these words and put your trust in Jesus. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is the Messiah. We thank you that he is the Son of God. We thank you that the apostles do not point us to simply a good man, to a miracle worker. They point us to Jesus. They point us to the man, the God-man who died for each one of us. They point us to one in whom we can trust. I'd ask Heavenly Father that if anyone doesn't know that relationship with Jesus today, that they would meet him, even today. They would come to know him, come to be saved. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.